Mr. Dudley was last here uh, just a couple of years ago in conversation with Matthew Winkler, our editor-in-chief emeritus. Um, and since then, so much has happened in the world, here in the United States and around the world, and we thought it would be a great time to continue that conversation um, as the Fed here in, the, in New York plays such a crucial role in driving the U.S. economy and, 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 and indeed making decisions that will help um, shape the globe. So we thought, let's come back, revisit that conversation, and see where we can uh, take the conversation and look at what, where, we, where we may go in the future. So with that, we're going to have Mr. Dudley and Matt come up to the stage. So let's welcome them. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen, and uh, President Dudley. Uh, this being Bloomberg, uh, we couldn't possibly have a conversation without some data compiled by Bloomberg. <laughs> so um, first, we need to remind everybody that uh, you, uh, impeccable timing, you become president of the Fed after probably the worst quarter in American history from an economic perspective. Uh, the stock market was on its way to losing 50%. Uh, GDP was plummeting, uh, all the major financial institutions were in some sort of chaos and being propped up. Um, you couldn't have picked a better time to step into a crisis, so congratulations for that. But we thought it was appropriate, let's go back and see where we were and what kind of uh, recovery we had. And as it turns out, looking at GDP growth out of recession, 1982 to the present, the 2009 rebound was actually the most aggressive since 1982, and you can see that white line there, folks. Um, unemployment. Um, the unemployment rate declined from its peak 2010 level um, since the 1980s, and it was, um, you know, the, the longest decline in unemployment since the 90s, and you can see that in the orange line here. Um, the bull market. In bonds, 10-year yield uh, below 8% during the recovery from recession. And you can see that here in the uh, blue line. Inflation, it declines from a peak 10% in 1981 to below 2% um, in the recovery uh, from the last recession. The stock market rally, which is now uh, imposed here. And you can see that this stock market, the green line, it's the greatest stock market rally from a recession that we've ever seen, certainly in over 50 years. Um, by way of perspective, it took 22 years to recover the losses from the 1929 crash, only four years to recover from the 2008 bear market. Um, interestingly enough, what kind of recovery did we see in the first year the Fed goes to work? Uh, and we'll get into that in a minute. Um, the S&P 500's gains was 59% in the first year of the bull market, and it turned out to be 366% from the March 2009 bottom to present. You had many critics because you started on this newfangled policy called quantitative easing. You were uh, acquiring myriad assets. Interest rates were at zero, and lots of people, led by distinguished academics, bankers, said, you were uh, on a ruinous path. You were going to debase the dollar as a reserve currency. Uh, you were going to drive up inflation. Um, and uh, we're still waiting for that to happen, OK? But that was the cautionary tale. So far, so good. So far, so good. One of the things we did at Bloomberg at the time to try to keep track of all the things you were doing, and we still have this function, WDCI, which is all the write downs. And there are 200, uh, 2 trillion of them uh, that were challenging the Fed. And this table right here shows. Uh, all of us, what that entailed, and it was quite extensive. One of the criticisms was you were hurting savers. And so just for perspective, even if you were in, say, the PIMCO uh, bond fund at the time, the biggest one, you still beat inflation, even as interest rates were at zero. And if you look right here on this uh, path, you can see um, not just the Treasury market, Bloomberg Barclays uh, Treasury Market Index, but you can also see the PIMCO fund and you can see inflation as well. The Yellen-led Fed actually came the closest to meeting the designated 
inflation target of 2%, more so than any other Fed. U.S. banks outperformed uh, their global peers since 2009. Um, the stock rally, incidentally, followed a credit market rebound, and that's what the, this data here shows us. And you can see the credit recovered faster than stocks. That's the yellow line here against the white line. And then you can also see the uh, U.S. bank uh, accelerating confidence. Something that was a characteristic uh, of the market that you inherited was something called value at risk, VAR, and uh, it collapsed uh, under the whole series of regulations that the Fed would impose uh, in its capacity. New York Fed would compose as its uh, the main regulator, and VAR just diminished to practically uh, insignificance from highs of 90%, say, for JP Morgan at the time and other banks. Return to profit of American banks with the stress test, which also, incidentally, was not considered uh, a welcome when it was introduced in 2009 by your predecessor, actually, who conceived it, Timothy Gartner, uh, Geithner. Uh, but the result was that bank profitability uh, uh, followed. Um, corporate America, if we look at debt ratios, they're probably the lowest ever. So if uh, we were measuring just the health of American companies by debt ratios, it's the lowest maybe uh, in any period, and at the same time, volatility under the Fed collapsed. We had record M&A, um, uh, and um, finally, we are at the present. And the Fed has introduced something that is very significant, as you well know, and it was because banks got into trouble with something called LIBOR. And as an alternative to LIBOR, and by the way, just so everybody understands what that trouble was, if you look back here um, at the white line and then the, the, uh, the orange line for everybody's benefit, the US dollar three-month LIBOR is the white line, and it's the rate major banks say how much they could borrow from each other for loans. And the OIS overnight index swap rate is the orange line. And look at the gap between them, you know, at the height of the financial crisis. And that was part of the problem, is that the Fed was already saying, here's where money should be, and the market was not behaving as it should. So you introduced this secured overnight financing rate as an alternative. Um, and I think a lot of people in this room and around the world would like to know right now just how committed is the Fed to seeing the secured overnight financing rate adopted, and will it replace LIBOR, which has $200 trillion notional outstanding, and especially in the context of uh, Andrew Bailey, who's the chief executive of Prudential Regulation Authority. Uh, he insisted that there's no compulsion to publish LIBOR beyond 2021. So welcome to Bloomberg. Thank you very much for being here. And would you please answer the question? OK, Thanks. sure. Um, we're absolutely committed to the secured overnight funding rate uh, for a variety of reasons. One, uh, uh, we need a rate that's uh, what's called IOSCO compliant. In other words, it has it's based on actual transactions. The secured overnight funding rate represents the Treasury repo market, which is a really deep and liquid market. And so that we know the rate actually reflects transactions in the marketplace unlike LIBOR, where a lot of the transactions are, uh, are there very, very few transactions, especially in the longer tenors, like three-month LIBOR, which is actually the, used for, for basis for many uh, financial contracts. Uh, so there's two problems with LIBOR. Number one, not always rooted in transactions. It depends on expert judge it, judgment. And as we saw uh, during the LIBOR scandal, that expert judgment creates incentives to manipulate, uh, to cheat to try to, to distort the, uh, the, the submitted rate. Uh, we think the secured overnight funding rate, since it's based on transactions, much less uh, risk of that. And the second thing is what you noted, uh, LIBOR is going away. Uh, banks are basically being compelled to continue to submit LIBOR by the Bank of England, but that's not something that they want to do because they recognize that there's flaws with LIBOR as a, as a reference rate. And so probably at the end of 2021, LIBOR will go away. And we need uh, a rate that all these you know, hundreds, of billions, hundreds of trillions of dollars of contracts can migrate to. And so, so far, it's the rate uh, that the ARC, which is a private sector committee, thinking about what reference rate can we actually migrate these 
uh, contracts to has selected. So I think what we're, you know, we're in the middle of the process. So we now have a very viable reference rate, SOFR. Uh, we now have futures on SOFR that just opened up uh, very recently. Uh, I think eventually we'll get a term uh, curve for SOFR. And then, uh, in, then the heavy lifting will occur, which is actually to move the existing set of contracts that we have today that reference LIBOR onto SOFR. Uh, but I think that uh, you know, our job is, at, at the Federal Reserve is to do two things. One, produce a IOSCO compliance reference rate, which we're doing. And two, to make sure that this transition happens in a timely way. Because if LIBOR were just to stop, would be a disaster because most of these contracts actually don't have anything uh, as a fallback rate. They basically say, if the library doesn't exist, call your bank for your rate. Well, that's not very feasible. So this is something that's going to be, uh, you know, very much uh, on the agenda of, 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 of Chair, Chairman Powell at the, at the board, Randy Quarles at the board, and my successor, John Williams, at the New York Fed. So there still is this anxiety, you're probably aware of it, that capital requirements could be increased. And if capital requirements were increased, so it is perceived that could torpedo the participation in this um, SOFR. So what assurances would you give the I market? I mean, I think that, uh, well, we know that the Treasury is still going to have to issue a lot of Treasury securities over the next, you know, 10 years. And in fact, the supply of Treasury is actually going up. So I'm pretty confident there's still going to be a very deep and liquid uh, Treasury repo market as those Treasuries need to be financed. So I think there's virtually, you know, no risk of that market going away, unlike LIBOR. So I, th I think that's the, this is a market, that, you know, we, you know, this rate was selected precisely because of the high degree of confidence that this rate will continue for a very, very long period of time. So... We just shared a brief survey of data showing steady growth, low inflation, lowest unemployment since 2000 today, uh, low debt ratios, healthy banks, economists see GDP growth above 2% through 2020, according to economists surveyed by Bloomberg. So do you think we're poised to break the record for the longest expansion? Uh, I wouldn't want to jinx it by making any presumptions. Uh, but I think the outlook over the next couple of years is pretty good. I mean, the economy is growing at above trend pace. Uh, businesses, seem, as you noted, seem to be in good shape financially. The household sector is in good shape financially. Household debt has been growing quite slowly during this, this cycle. Um, we saw today another good uh, healthy gain in payroll employment. Uh, so I'd be surprised if the uh, expansion were to end uh, in the next year or two. Now, there are some clouds that I see over the longer term. Uh, one cloud is what's going to happen on trade policy. Are we going to continue with an open trade system, or are we going to raise trade barriers and get into a trade war? You know, if we go down that, the bad path, then that would obviously create quite a bit of risk for the U.S. economy. And the second thing is fiscal sustainability. Um, you know, the corporate tax reform uh, probably was overdue, uh, but this is a lot of fiscal stimulus at late in the cycle, number one. And number two, if you look at the fiscal pro deficit projections uh, from the Congressional Budget Office, there are budget deficits of 45 to 5.5% of GDP for over the next decade. Uh, that means the debt to GDP ratio in the U.S., which is already high, is going to keep climbing. So I think there are some real fiscal sustainability issues that may ultimately become quite relevant to the U.S. economic outlook uh, down the road. Since you mentioned it, the stimulus, otherwise known as a very big tax cut. Well, there's two pieces. There's the tax cut and then there's the increase in the spending caps. So um, are you seeing any signs yet of major investment by companies? Well, I think investment spending has been doing, you know, reasonably well. I mean, it's been growing six percent plus each of the last two quarters. Uh, are we seeing a, a, a signs of an acceleration from that pace? Not yet, but I wasn't expecting to be seeing that quite yet. Uh, you know, it takes time for businesses to decide to increase investment. They have to actually have projects to invest in. So I think the jury's out. I mean, I think I think we're. I think most people are pretty confident that the tax uh, legislation will uh, encourage investment because it basically reduces the, the statutory corporate tax rate. So corporations will have higher profits because of a lower corporate tax rate, at least, at least for the short term. And it also reduces the user cost of capital significantly because it has 100% expensing for new investments. So it'd be, it'd be shocking if that didn't lead to, to stronger investment. I think the key question is how much.
uh, you know, his investment spending is a couple percent uh, stronger. That probably doesn't have huge implications for, you know, the growth rate of the economy, its potential growth rate over time. But if you get something more powerful than that, then that, then that has implications for how fast the economy can grow over the well, longer term. The sponsors of the tax cut equated it with rocket fuel for companies investing. Is that... Well, we'll see. I mean, uh, my, you know, my own view is if you look at historically, uh, investment spending has really not been that sensitive to the cost of capital. So I think there's definitely going to be a positive effect on investment spending. But I guess I would expect that it'll probably be more modest than, than really large. Uh, so far, we haven't seen really any sign of an acceleration. But, you know, it's early days, so I wouldn't take much evidence from that. So uh, something that you did achieve in the past uh six years, and especially the last four years, was the Fed came closest uh, to meeting this inflation target of 2%. Um, I mean, people could say better lucky than smart, but the fact is you go back all the way to Arthur Burns uh, as chairman of the Fed, which is going back a long way. Um, I think you were just beginning to think about being an economist at Goldman Sachs, and I was just beginning to write stories for the Wall Street Journal, so that's a <laughs> long time ago. So what did the Fed do the past four years well, that, I think the, that, you know, made the difference? Well, I think, you know, I think what is important in terms of what the Fed did was twofold. One, we've actually accomplished our mission. And look, I think the confusion about quantitative easing was that people didn't fully... Coinciding with the uh, QE programs, one and two. The economy cooperated. Uh, so we actually had a very steady recovery, economy growing, and there would have been a lot more volatility. But even as late, you could say as late as 2012, you had, you know, I was completely, you know, in, in line with in the financial markets and creating interest rate fixing. Uh, some people that were graduating from business schools were, were be great if we could bring that to the U.S. So you have uh, most people that I talk to in the markets think that this is all working pretty well. The banks have that was a change that was essentially overdue. Uh, it would be nice if it had happened before the financial crisis, uh, but obviously, you know, banks are going to accept regulation if they don't they don't think that they need it. And so you sort of had to have the financial crisis for them to really understand that, uh, at, given their size, given their dependence on wholesale funding. Uh, they needed a, a, a little bit better safety net than what they had before. So it's a decade later. Do you have any sense that there are any regrets about those investment banks becoming essentially deposit-taking institutions in the Fed I think context? you'd have to. I think you'd have to ask them. But I think you know, if you go back to that time, I think that there's a good likelihood at least one of those two investment banks, maybe both of them, would not have survived without. It was really two things that we did at the time. One, one was. They, they became bank holding companies. But two, we also uh, ba basically said, you need to go out and raise capital to demonstrate to the market that you're a viable concern. So if you, look, if you go back and look at the history, it wasn't just that they became bank holding companies, but it's also they demonstrated to the market that they could actually raise capital. And so those two things in combination, I think, uh, uh, supported confidence. The last thing that happened, of course, was the, the, was the, the famous stress test uh, in the spring of, of, of 2009. And that was very, very significant because uh, we did a very tough stress test on the banking system. Uh, we published a tremendous amount of the results, so they're very transparent. And uh, I remember reading the next day I came into the office, and you know, the question is, is this going to be viewed as credible or not? And a leading hedge fund uh, who who'd, who'd looked at our analysis said, big headline on their piece, we agree. And then I knew that we'd actually uh, you know, turned the corner on confidence. Because when you're in a bad uh, economic situation and a financial situation, confidence is really key. And once you get that confidence back and firms are willing to engage with each other and people know that they're going to actually be able to obtain funding, then they can actually return to their normal place in providing a, a financial services to, 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 to the economy. If you looked at the data, one could see at least a correlation between the stress tests and the recovery of confidence in the banks as just measured by the performance. Yeah, uh, I, I viewed that as a, a, cre a key turning point. And what helped, of course, was we had TARP, uh, 
and the TARP had some money, and that money was available to recapitalize these banks if the banks ultimately were going to, if the banks turned out to ultimately have trouble uh, raising funds. So the TARP legislation provided the backstop equity to ensure the public that the equity was going to go in one way or the other. Either the banks were going to go out into the market and raise the equity, or the government was going to put the equity in. So in the narrative of the recovery from the worst recession since the Great Depression, uh, there was um, too big to fail, uh, and there was also giant vampire squid and Occupy Wall Street. Uh, but what you're talking about kind of got lost, didn't it, in understanding. And you were perceived as maybe the enemy, right, because you came from Wall Street too, right? Well, I mean, I don't, I don't try to worry too much about what people think of me. Um, I think the, you know, the, the problem of the crisis was that uh, the Federal Reserve, in extremis, uh, was forced to do extraordinary things to keep large financial institutions from failing. We weren't trying to keep them from failing for that, those firms' sake. We were doing that because if those firms failed, that would take down the entire financial system and generate far worse outcomes for households and businesses. But the problem was that these firms were saved, households lost their homes, business, small businesses failed. And so there was a fundamental unfairness about the financial crisis that you know, we were perceived as contributing to. But believe me, I, th I think what we did was the right thing. I think it far beats the alternative of having a Great Depression because obviously if that happened, maybe you would have had justice uh, in some sense that you know, these large firms would have failed, but it would have been far worse for households and businesses as well. And in fact, um you rescued essentially homeowners from the first housing catastrophe maybe in a century, right? Well, I don't think we rescued them. I mean, a lot of people, there were a lot of foreclosures, a lot of people lost their homes. So I would say we put a floor under the economy uh, that, t that meant we had a very severe recession rather than a Great Depression, uh, and, 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 and then we got a subsequent economic recovery. I mean, what I'm proudest about is where we are today. I mean, I think, you know, I'm going to retire in, in, uh, in, in June, and it's, it is nice to be able to say you're retiring at a time that the unemployment rate is, t as of today, 3.9%, which is the lowest it's been in, in several decades, and inflation is pretty close to our target. So I feel good about this is a good time to step off the stage. So what are the lessons that you can say you've learned from this recession? Um, well, there's a whole bunch of lessons. I mean, we could be here for quite a while, but I think the most important one is that the Federal Reserve has to be, you know, a little bit more forward looking in terms of thinking about financial stability as a risk to the economy. I mean, so I think we get, I think we deserve some credit for how we responded post the, 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 the you know, in the middle of the financial crisis. But we had some culpability for the financial crisis actually occurring. And I think uh, at the time, there was this sort of notion that uh, you can't identify bubbles in real time. You can only clean up after the fact. Uh, I never agreed with that. Uh, and I think the crisis showed that that was not a really good uh, template. So now, much more proactive in trying to look at the economy, identify incipient financial asset bubbles. You know, every other FOMC meeting, we have a whole session that looks at financial stability risks that face the U.S. economy. So let's, let's focus on that for a minute or two. Um, people may not remember this, but the calamity sort of started in housing itself uh, with something called subprime. And uh, that was a boon to housing, actually, the subprime mortgage. And it pretty much surged everywhere, particularly in California, but also uh, uh, coast to coast, north to south, east to west. You had subprime mortgages. And then you had uh, Wall, Street, Wall Street and all of its creativity taking uh, essentially the debt from subprime, yeah, mixing, packaging mix, it, mixing it in a right. cocktail with treasury yeah. securities, yeah. your favorite securities. <laughs> And, uh, and then selling it to the rest of the world with higher yields, and everybody had yep. an appetite for higher yields, and yep. so this stuff was gobbled up. So then you had this American export called toxic debt, um, which came out of that. And, and at the time of subprime, if I recall, lots of very important people said, Whatever it is, it'll be contained. And that was sort of a favorite word. Well, people looked at the actual size of the subprime market, and at the time, it didn't seem very large. What they didn't recognize that is that this was not the real problem. The real problem was a housing boom uh, 
that was being driven by very lax underwriting standards. And that boom was basically leading to a vast increase in housing supply, which was going to inevitably lead to a price bust on the other side. So when we got to the other side and prices started to go down, you know, all the bad lending decisions were exposed. All the uh, bad structures in terms of these securities were exposed. And so that was really the, 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 down, the downside. Uh, a, lot, a lot of reasons why we had a, had a financial crisis. But I think the housing boom and bust really lies at the core. So again, what does the Fed know now that you think would prevent it from making the same maybe errors or lapses of understanding? Well, I think that, that if, you know, I think if, you know, if you go back and sort of say, how could it have been different? Well, how it could it have been different is the Federal Reserve, I think, could have been paid a lot more attention to the lax underwriting standards that were basically fueling the housing boom. Now, subprime, I think, you, you know, some people thought that subprime was actually a, a, a good innovation because it helped lower and moderate income households uh, actually purchase homes. The bad part of the story, though, was, was when the underwriting practices just became, you know, the so-called ninja loans, no income, no job, but you still could get a, a, a mortgage loan. So it was really the very poor underwriting practices for mortgages that I think was something that the Federal Reserve could have probably pushed harder against. Recognizing that the responsibility for underwriting practices in the United States is incredibly diffuse. You know, there are state mortgage brokers. Uh, some of this is done through the securities firms. Some of this is done at the bank. So, you know, it would have been hard, but I would have felt better if the Federal Reserve had tried harder. So lots of commentators, both journalistic and economic, have said that uh, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin in particular, is uh, little more than little more sophisticated than uh, Dutch tulips <laughs> centuries ago. Uh, having said that, they may have written that when Bitcoin was $4,000 and now it's somewhere around $9,000. So what do you make of this event? Well, I think, you know, Bitcoin uh, is not a very good currency because it's not a stable store of value. Uh, it's not legal tender. Uh, and it's actually not even a very good payments medium. I mean, if you try to transact on Bitcoin, uh, the transactions take a long time to execute. And the amount of throughput, how many transactions you can put through the Bitcoin pipes is very, very limited. Uh, so I don't think it's a currency. I think it's mostly a, a speculation at this point. I think people should be very careful in speculating on uh, digital currency. Now, the part of Bitcoin that is interesting is the distributed ledger uh, blockchain technology that sort of underpins it. And I think that blockchain technology actually may actually be quite interesting from a technological perspective in terms of uh, having independent places where you can verify uh, transactions. And therefore, it's not all you know, centralized in one location. And that gives you, could potentially give you a lot of resiliency, again, from a cybersecurity perspective. So a lot of people are working on the blockchain technology, which I think is actually quite interesting. Uh, the Bitcoin as an asset class, uh, I'd be quite a bit more skeptical about. So going back to uh, January 1st, 2009, um, just about everything was going wrong <clears throat> with the financial system, with the economy even the developed economy as we know it. What were you thinking back then um, in those days when lots of people thought the stock market uh, was gone as, as we knew it? Um, I was thinking about, okay, what's, what's the problem <laughs> and how can we address it with the Fed's, the, the tools that the Fed has? Um, you know, obviously, you know, the Fed is much more constrained than people think by the Federal Reserve Act in terms of what we can do. So, if it, for example, we can't buy any asset. We can only buy treasuries and agencies, mortgage-backed securities. And so within the confines of what the Federal Reserve Act, Act allows us to do, what can we do to actually stabilize the situation? And, you know, stabilizing the situation is basically about restoring confidence. And so we rolled out a lot of different uh, liquidity facilities, commercial paper funding facility, the term asset-backed lending facility. Um, there were guarantees from the FDIC. So the government, not just the Federal Reserve, but the government broadly came forward and tried to essentially backstop the financial system to restore confidence so that lenders and borrowers would re-engage. And that re-engagement was absolutely essential if we were going to have a viable economic recovery. And when did you think that you were succeeding? I, I, as I said before, I think the stress test, the results of the stress so test. So spring of 09. Spring of 09. I mean, the economy was, was starting to show signs of stabilizing prior to, this, 
to the stress test results. But when the stress test results came out and markets participants said, I believe them, that this is a viable stress test that has credibility of the market, that's when I felt that we'd actually turned the corner. Now, were we, were we home free? No, not by a long shot. The second thing that actually helped was it turned out that the TARP capital that was injected in the major US banks was essentially a little bit, they, they didn't like the TARP capital because it came with lots of restrictions. And so as we got through the rest of 2009, banks started to go out and aggressively raise equity so they could actually pay off their TARP capital from the government. That, that was actually a really good thing because it basically meant that the banks recapitalized themselves quite quickly. And so I think one of the reasons why you saw in your slides that you showed earlier why the US banks came back pretty quickly is that they recapitalized themselves much faster than any other banking system in the world. So how would you characterize the US banking industry today precisely in that context? I think it's global it's, peers. I think, I think it's I think it's healthy. I think it has a, lot, a much bigger capital cushion, much bigger liquidity cushion. Uh, but the banks are making profits. The return on equity is sufficient that the major US banks trade at book value well above one. So that's telling you that they're earning their cost of capital. So I think they're, you know, I think the banking system is healthier than it's been in a, in a long time. Do you hear from some banks that uh, the capital requirements are still too onerous and that's impairing our profitability? Uh, you hear a little bit of that. I think, I think what you hear more about is that there's so many different capital requirements. There's a leverage ratio. There's uh, the Basel capital requirements. There's the this, this stress test that the Fed does every year. So I think that uh, what uh, 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 Vice Chair Quarles is looking at, which I support, is how can we make this regime more efficient? So I felt that you know I had I had a part to play, and it was and it was and it was it was rewarding to me to be able to contribute. So there are, there are a lot of people younger than us in this uh, room. Um, I'm sure there are. <laughs> when when we were as young as they are, um, you were actually every day t talking about the market at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York making policy? No, but I knew that I wanted to get back in policy. I, I, I started my career at the Board of Governors in Washington, the Federal Reserve, and uh, I, I did want to get back into policy for a number of years. Uh, my first sort of you know, close call was uh, when Bob Rubin went to Washington in, in 1993 as the head of the uh, National Economic uh, Council. Uh, and it, but it just took a long while. And uh, Tim Geithner, uh, I retired from Goldman at the end of 05, and Tim Geithner uh, asked me in 2006, will you be willing to come on board and be head of the markets group? You know, it was six months of calm, followed by several years of chaos. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I was really glad that I had the opportunity to do that. And, of course, when Tim uh, got kicked upstairs to become the Treasury Secretary, I was fortunate to become the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. So those last five years of the 90s, uh, were also tumultuous in the sense that uh, you had uh, great GDP growth. Yeah, we had the technology boom. You had the dot-com boom, yep. which yep. actually became something of a bust because yep. you had all these companies that had no earnings. They had cash yep. earnings, they called them at the right. time. But, but the but difference no. was the damage to the U.S. economy was far less because there wasn't a lot of leverage. There wasn't a lot of dependence on wholesale funding markets. There wasn't a big loss of confidence in the in the ability of the financial system to function. So, you know, the dot com boom and bust was a big boom and bust, but the effects on the financial system and how the economy performed were pretty mild. So, um, did you have any inkling? Um, I guess uh, by the time you were at the Fed, um, working for Tim, I guess, uh, of what was unfolding. Well, no, not not based I mean, on your experience. Well, I mean, when when we were at, when I was at Goldman, my, me and a colleague Ed McKelvey wrote a piece called "The Dark Side of the of the uh, of the of the Brave New Business Cycle," and the thesis of this piece is, was we're going to have long-lived economic expansions for a whole variety of reasons: inventories being less important, more open trade, and all these things were mean that the economic expansions were going to tend to last longer and be less volatile. The dark side was that people were going to become then complacent because they're going to get used to these very, you know, sort of benign economic expansions. And as a consequence, this was our thesis, that when you actually did have a bad draw in terms of the economy, there's going to be a lot more financial consequence. Now, I had no idea it was going to play out like it did in the, in the great financial crisis, but, the, but there were the seeds of the idea there. And I think I, you know, I think I, I, I did have a sense that, that the whole housing boom 
could unwind in a very bad way. We had done a lot of work at Goldman Sachs in the run-up to the housing boom, and we were focused very much on people, how people were using uh, their housing equity as a piggy bank to finance consumer spending. And we felt that that was probably not a very sustainable uh, thing. And the thing that really, uh, really tipped my view of things was, I can't remember exactly when I, I discovered this, but there was a website called condoflip.com. And condoflip.com was about how you could get in the queue to buy a Miami Beach condo. Not to buy the condo, just to get in line to buy the condo. And there was a whole mania about just actually trading places in line on condoflip.com. And when I saw that, <laughs> I was pretty com confident that this was going to end badly. So I think on that note, uh, there are probably some questions from our guests uh, to here today. And so maybe we can take a few if that's possible. Yeah, I see a hand right here. Uh, Catherine Mann, I'm the, Mann, I'm the uh, chief economist at Citi. Uh, so there's a period of complacency now, perhaps, um, slowly coming to an end as the Federal Reserve proceeds on its normalization path. How much uh, volatility in financial markets do you think your colleagues are going to be willing to accept uh, along that path before they, uh, before they change that path. I, I'm wondering, are you going to tie yourself to the mast? I, look, I don't think the Federal Reserve is, is, cares about financial markets per se. We care about uh, two, two goals, uh, maximum sustainable employment in the context of price stability. Now, do financial markets and how financial markets perform affect the real economy and therefore affect our ability to attain those goals? Yes. So the financial markets are not completely irrelevant. But our goal isn't a given level of the stock market or a given level of volatility in financial markets. I'm actually happy that volatility in financial markets picked up a little bit. I thought that the very low period of volatility we've had over the last few years uh, was potentially dangerous because people were start starting to get confident that, there, that the markets had, had very little risk. And so the fact that we've actually had a little bit of an upturn in volatility this year, and that's sort of shaken the, the, the tree branches a bit and shaken out some of the sort of weak products like the inverse uh, VIX uh, uh, exchange-traded products, uh, I think that's actually a good thing. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, if the stock market were going to go down a lot and interest rates were going to go up a lot, that would change the economic outlook. And if it changed the economic outlook, it would have implications for the path of monetary policy. But only if it changes the economic outlook uh, is it going to actually have implications for how the Federal Reserve conducts monetary you policy. You mentioned, by the way, uh, earlier um, that the Fed has been more effective communicating to the market. Well, and we're you trying. Mentioned, you mentioned forward we're guidance. and we're you, Do you think the, the reduction in volatility is a consequence of the Fed's more effective communication to the market? Well, it's funny. When, when we do the number of rate hikes that, the, that we said we would do a year earlier, the market says we're communicating really well. That was last year. When we don't do the number of rate hikes that we said we were going to do at the beginning of the year, uh, 2016, the market says we're not communicating so well. So, you know, I, I, I think it really it depends a little bit on, uh, you know, for, you know the, the, how the environment's actually uh, unfolding. Look, we're trying to be a lot more transparent. And, and the Fed has moved dramatically in the direction of transparency, not just in the last few years, but over several decades. I mean, prior to 1994, the Federal Reserve wouldn't even announce that it actually made a monetary policy change. You had to actually infer the monetary policy change by whether the Fed did an open market operation or didn't do an open market operation that you would have expected. And from that, you would infer that the Fed had actually changed uh, the level of interest rates. I'm a big proponent of more transparency. I think it's uh, served the Federal Reserve well. If you're transparent and, and market participants understand how the Fed is going to react to incoming information, that allows the markets to anticipate what the Fed's uh, are going to do. And that actually makes the linkage between the Fed and financial conditions more uh, robust, because that's what really matters. I mean, at the end of the day, the, the, the economy doesn't get driven by the federal funds rate. It gets driven by how the federal fund rate affects financial conditions. And then it's financial conditions that actually drive the, the economy. More transparency probably t tightens that linkage. And so that probably makes monetary policy more effective. I see a hand back there, I think. So um, on, the, on the volatility uh, question, since it comes up again and again and again, um, 
one of the things that the Fed has done since you got started is much more talking about everything the Fed is doing. Is that what you're focused on? Well, I mean, I think there, you know, there's a question about whether the Fed is sort of too predictable. Uh, and if the Fed is too predictable, is that, does that lead to complacence in financial markets? You know, there was a, you know, there was a criticism of the Fed over the 2004-2006 period when the Fed literally raised interest rates every meeting quarter point, you know, year after year, that that basically caused uh, some of the complacency that led to the financial crisis. So there is some, some people that argue that the Fed should be more unpredictable. I don't really agree with that because at the end of the day, uh, we want the markets to be able to think along with the Fed and deliberately sort of creating noise in the system uh, so that markets are more volatile. That doesn't seem to me to be uh, a very efficient regime. If the, if the markets understand what the Fed is going to do, then the markets can actually anticipate the Fed's action before the Fed actually acts. So it can actually, actually tighten financial conditions or ease financial conditions even before the Fed acts. So I'm not a big fan of the idea of the Fed sort of deliberately obscuring uh, what it's going to do or what its goals are. I think it, I think it works much better if we're, or if we're transparent. So oh, here's a question right here. This table. Yeah. And if you could just. Remind us who you are. Yeah, thank hi, you. For it's Henson Orser from Nomura Securities. Um, you, you mentioned uh, transparency and a better correlation between Fed funds and financial conditions. Um, the Fed's gone now six times, and, and yet financial conditions haven't tightened that much, um, certainly not as much as they did when they mentioned taper tantrum and financial conditions tightened a lot. We've started to reduce the balance sheet, and yet there still is no term premium. Uh, in the markets, in fact, it, it, it may be negative. Um, does that surprise you at all? Do you think there's another shoe to drop? Well, I mean, I think term premium are low for a, a number of reasons. One is quantitative easing, not just in the U.S., but around the world. So we're not the only uh, central bank that you know has expanded their, our balance sheet. And the Bank of Japan and, and, and uh, uh, ECB are continuing to expand their balance sheet. So that's number one. Number two, term premium may also be low for, for a different reason, because people are less worried about the inflation risk to the upside. So in the, in the old regime, when we had an inflation problem, uh, you had to be compensated for that inflation risk uh, from holding longer duration assets. But if you, if you now view that the inflation risk is, is, is lower because the Federal Reserve has done a better job stabilizing inflation, there's less risk of, bu of buying longer dated securities. So you know, I think some of it's the quantitative easing around the world. Some of it is uh, probably a, a little bit more confidence that inflation is going to stay uh, sustainably low in, in, in the future. Yes, sir. Uh, Michael Hansen, I'm the uh, head of Global Macro Strategy at TD Securities. So when the um, FOMC gave the most recent statement, there was this uh, second mention of uh, symmetric that the market got uh, kind of very uh, interested in and took sort of a dovish interpretation. And so I'm curious, obviously, you were in the room making the decision, and nothing that goes in the statement is uh, obviously deliberated quite uh, substantially. Did, was that, in your mind, uh, a signal of some sort of change in the, the Fed's reaction function? Was it a way to, to signal the Fed's willingness to overshoot? Uh, on the inflation objective, and in an earlier speech, you had mentioned that sort of it would take some sort of a substantial, meaningful overshooting and change policy. What would that look like? In your well, I can't speak for my uh, f fellow FMC participants. I can only speak for myself. Look, I think I said it many times that uh, you know being a little bit above two percent after being below two percent for many, many years is not a problem. And I've said it for many, many times that it, that our inflation objective uh, target is symmetric. You know, we we had this uh, concern that people in the marketplace were sort of viewing that two percent was a ceiling, and I've said it repeatedly in speeches for 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 many, many months, maybe probably years now, that the uh, target's symmetric. It's not a floor. Uh, so I think it's very, that's very consistent with what we now see in the, in, in the statement. So when, uh, speaking of the FOMC, when uh, the votes come, uh, is there, uh, in your experience, uh, a special cachet that's attached to the vote that comes from 
New York, <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would not be the right person to, to judge that. Look, I think the New York Fed is unique in the sense that most central banks, the policy making apparatus and the execution of policy apparatus in the same location. Uh, at the Federal Reserve, it's split. So the, the FOMC sets policy, but the Federal Reserve Bank of New York actually executes on that policy. Uh, that's one reason why, uh, you know, at the Bank for International Settle Settlements, the New York Fed plays a, a special role. I'm actually headed uh, uh, this evening to the, the, the Basel, Switzerland, for I think my 51st visit. Um, and, you know, that's, we're there. I think the New York Fed is there because we actually are part of the operational part of, of the monetary policy setting process. You know, also, I think the New York Fed, uh, you, know, is, you know, we sit in New York City, which is a major financial center. And we're the, the, the one, we're the bank that actually has all the, the international engagement. So the BIS is part of that. So I think, you know, I think that you're going to Basel tonight. <laughs> um, what are you going to do after June? Uh, Tim Geithner used to always say, plan beats no plan. Well, I'm actually inverting that. No plan beats plan, <laughs> so, at, least for, at least for a while. So thank you very much for coming here today. And uh, here's hoping all's well with you in the months ahead. Thank Thanks you, so Matt. Much. Appreciate it. Thank you.